Now, on the outline you've received, I'm going to concentrate on three aspects of preaching. But that's not my starting point. Let's say you preach by the seaside in Svandidna, for example, and 100 people are converted. What would you do with them? I'm not going to do all the talking this morning, come on. What would you do with them? You'd direct them to a church. What sort of church would you direct them to? Pardon? Why? Pardon? So then grow in the word. And preaching is a wonderful thing. I'm enthusiastic about preaching. I've seen hundreds of folk converted through preaching. I hope you have too. I've seen marriages sorted out through preaching. I've seen baby Christians grow into mature Christians through preaching. I've seen fearful saints face dying with courage because of preaching. I've seen folk who are oppressed by temptation become victorious through preaching. It's all done by preaching. Um, wherever the, the cause of God prospers, preaching prospers. And wherever preaching prospers, the cause of God prospers. I actually can't think of anything in the whole world more important than preaching except one thing. That's walking with God yourself. But I want to talk about preaching. I'm very enthusiastic about preaching. So I think we'd better start by asking what it is. Who's going who's to hazard a definition? I haven't any gun with me. I'm not Billy Sunday who once shot a member. He once shot somebody dead um, in a service. Sorry? Persuading people of what God says. What's good about that definition? Persuading is good. God, what else is good? What God says. Where do you discover where God? Where do you discover what God says? Anywhere else? Up to a point in creation. How do you know that? Yeah, because it says so in the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> quite right. Yes. Okay. So exposition is um, scripture is to do with the Bible, and basically um, preaching is simply this: it's telling people what the Bible means and what it means to them. If I just told them what the Bible means, what would that be? Boring. It would be a lecture. If I tell people what the Bible means and what it means to them, it immediately becomes preaching. And that's the big difference. Now, there are three things I'm going to concentrate on. But before we even get down to those, preaching must therefore have two great features, and they're already on the outline on the first page. What must be the two great features of preaching? They must be there, otherwise it can't possibly be preaching. What else? Right, what on earth is exegetical accuracy? The word and the spirit. The word and the spirit, yes, go on. There's something else? I think that's what you're going to tell us now. No. <laughs> <laughs> what the passage means. Not what I think it means. What it actually means. What, what the author intended. And by author I mean big A, not small A. Because what the author intended may not be what the author intended, if you understand. Do you understand? Yeah. You've always got to look for the divine author's intention in inspiring this particular passage. So, um, exegetical accuracy is preaching what the Bible means. You preach its intended meaning. Now, we don't have much of that in Wales. In Wales, people tend to preach the thoughts which strike them as they read the passage. That is not preaching. Or the thoughts which come rushing into their mind as they read the passage. That is not preaching. Preaching is preaching the intended meaning of the verse, the paragraph, the chapter, the book, or however big a chunk you're preaching from. Right? Now what is doctrinal substance? Because that's the other big thing which makes preaching preaching. What on earth is it? Have a guess. 
and a bit more. We're on the right track. Anything more you'd like to add to that? Yes, yeah, and a bit more than that. Right, so when I've read the whole of the Bible, I can conclude that in these 1,200 pages, these 1,200 pages actually teach me something about God. And actually, I can write down what these 1,200 pages teach about God. Or these 1,200 pages, your Bible might have 1,300. What do they teach about sin? And I can actually write down what the Bible teaches about sin. In other words, the Bible con contains a system of truth. It does. And as I preach a passage, I've got to keep that system of truth in mind, but also see what parts of that system of truth are in the passage that I'm preaching from. Otherwise, it's not preaching. Because the whole purpose of preaching is to preach how much of the Bible? All the whole counsel of God. So I'm trying to lay a couple of foundations there. So preaching is explaining what the Bible means and what it means to you. Its great characteristics are exegetical accuracy, I love these long words, and doctrinal substance. In other words, you actually advance people in their knowledge of that great system of truth. Now, once those things are clear, there are three things I want to, to focus on. Why do you think I want to focus on these three things? The first one is making preaching memorable. The second one is... putting eyes into people's ears. And the third one is... Right, okay. Because I'm pretty much convinced that most pulpit preaching does not do most of these three things. I'm pretty much convinced that the average person listening to preaching remembers Coronation Street better than they remember Sunday's sermon. I've just come back from Brazil, I got back on Tuesday, and I met a young man there called Ronaldo. You might have, met, might have met him. He said, Mr. Olive, he said, I've just spent a year in the UK. I said, oh yeah. He said, I've heard hundreds of sermons. He says, there's something I can't believe. I said, what's that? How dull they are, he said. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? Terrible thing for a young man to say. The preaching here was dull. It wasn't memorable. Right, what, what, was, what did you hear preached last Sunday, fellas? Yeah. What did you hear preached last Sunday? <coughs> Pardon? Okay, you knew what it was about. Anyway, that's great. That's good. Oh. <laughs> All right. That's a new one anyway. Most of us don't remember very easily what we heard. And frankly, preaching should be so stunning, so arresting, so extraordinary, so compelling that we should be able to remember easily what we heard the last time we heard some preaching. But it isn't like that. And one of the main reasons is on this whole question of structure. So, all our labours will be lost if our hearers can't follow what we're saying. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if there are any ladies present. I'm just having a look at one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who constructed the human soul? God, right. God constructed the human soul in such a way that certain ways of speaking get through. And certain ways of speaking don't get through. The human soul is constructed that way. So if you speak in those ways which don't get through, you must be offending man made in the image of God. The human soul has been constructed in such a way that certain ways of speaking get through. And you know that. Two people can stand up and give you exactly the same information. Now, one says, a tertiary number of visually impaired rodents. <laughs> and the other one says three blind mice right. 
Which gets through easier? Why? Have you ever thought about that? What? <laughs> if someone talks to you from the platform <laughs> and says, I've got something really important to say to you today, it, it doesn't have the same effect, does it? As, I've got something really important to say to you today. Why? Have you ever thought about that? Or if someone says to you, my peroration on this blessed morning <laughs> is based upon the 13th verse of the 14th chapter of the second epistle of, it, it switches you off. Why? And I think there's not been enough, enough reflection about the nature of the human soul. What forms of speech get through and what forms of speech don't? And if we can answer that question, we're beginning to understand something of how the human soul is constructed. Now, one thing is for certain. Something which is structured gets through. Question. Why? Why does logic get through? <coughs> it's memorable, it's easy to remember because we were only simple people. They're linked together. Yeah. People talk about attention span. Nearly everything they say about attention span is nonsense. Here we are in an ordinary terrace street in Liverpool where I lived for 23 years. There's a child playing with another child out in the street. Then they have a little bit of an argument. So this one runs and gets his dad. And this one runs and gets his dad. And out now come the two dads. And they have an argument. <laughs> and after a little while, the wives come out to back them up, as they do. And they get involved in the argument. And before long, the whole street is there watching. <laughs> Why? And it lasts two hours. And then they go indoors. And they can tell you blow by blow, sentence by sentence, what this one said and what that one said. And then the educationalist says, do you know that the attention span of modern men and women is only 18 minutes? How come that they can remember a two-hour argument but can't remember the average 18-minute sermon? Except mine are longer than that. And it's all to do with, with passion and logic and reason and all the other things because the human soul is constructed that way. Structure gets through, which is why I want to talk about that now. Your sermons, if you preach from the pulpit, will have structure. If you love your people, if you understand your people, if you know people, you will have structure. If a sermon has unity, it will get through. What's the alternative to unity? What on earth is that? Chaos. Chaos. <laughs> if your collection is just a, if your sermon is just a collection of sentences which are sort of thrown together, it won't get through. But if the whole thing sort of links together, it will. If your sermon has order, it will get through. What's the alternative to order? Yeah. What is disorder? <laughs> yeah, all sorts of things sort of thrown together, but there's no obvious link and there's no progression. If your sermon has proportion, the different points in it have proportion, it will get through. Why? What's the alternative to proportion? Pardon? Possibly. Ah, all right. He thinks in pictures, this one. Good, yeah. <laughs> what do you think I'm getting at? Well, let's say I have three points in my sermon, and the first point lasts 23 minutes. How long do you expect the second one to last? <laughs> 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 
If I preached a sermon where the first point had 23 minutes and the second, the second point, the first point had 23 minutes and the second point had 7 minutes and the third point had 2 minutes, what would you feel? And, what, and how would you feel about that sermon? Why would you feel that? So you feel uncomfortable. But why do you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, you would feel that, wouldn't you? I personally, if someone does, and I'm actually I'm talking about a specific sermon I heard when I used those figures just there. It was 23 minutes, then it was 7 minutes, then it was 2 minutes. I went out of the church feeling cheated. Had I been cheated? I don't know, but I felt cheated. Why? <laughs> is it just me well partly it is my wife says yes because if I go to a mantelpiece and there's two candlesticks there and a vase there and three objects here that really drives me nuts I like to have a candlestick and a candlestick and try and arrange the other objects with some form of symmetry I think I'm, I must be a bit, bit fanatical about this but we don't like disproportion. Have you ever thought about that? Have you? Interesting. Yeah. Have you ever de- analysed it? No, most of us don't think about what we're doing. So, right. So, we've got to have structure. What would be the first element in structure? It's on the outline anyway. Shoot him dead. What's the first? What's the first element in structure? On the pardon? Why? Why have I got to have an introduction? So what you're aiming for, okay? Yeah. Get them tuned in. So we need a few opening remarks to get get everybody tuned in. And as I have often said to people, this is the prelude before the symphony. You are is somebody. This is the dawn before the rising of the sun. This is the starters before the meal. This is the porch in front of the house. But most of us need something to sort of just usher us into the subject. So what really is the purpose of the introduction? Yeah, because I'm already switched on. I've been preparing it all week, haven't I? And over there is someone who doesn't care less I've got to somehow arrest their ap- apathy. And over there is someone who does care um, very much and wants to ser- just wants to go home. And somehow I've got to uh, arrest their opposition. And over there is someone who doesn't actually believe that preachers will ever say anything worthwhile. And somehow or other I've got to grab hold of them. And I've got to somehow arrest their interest and prepare the way so that when I get into the subject, people are going to follow it. What would happen if I just jumped into the subject? I would leave most of them behind, I think, yeah. So the story is told of this, this, this man who had an incredibly stubborn donkey. Do you know this story? That's because you haven't read my book. This is a very good book on preaching, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it, it took me 66 years to write this. That's how old I am, by the way. This is, this is 66 years hard work. I hope you're going to read it. Otherwise, I wasted my time. Anyway, there's a... St- this, there was this man who had this incredibly stubborn donkey. He just would not do as it was told. And then he read in the paper that there was a doctor who could make stubborn donkeys obedient painlessly. So he sent for this doctor who arrived at the farm and he said, you can do something with this, this donkey? He says, yes, of course. He says, well, go ahead then. Well, the doctor opened his bag and he got out this great big hammer and he beat the thing around the head. He said, stop, 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 said the farmer. You said you could do it painlessly. He said, I can, but I've got to get his attention first. <laughs> and that's the way it is in preaching. Yeah. What faults would, could an introduction have? <coughs> Pardon? It could take most of the sermon. So you're building this massive porch... 
and then you go into a little grass hut. Ever heard a sermon like that? I've heard a few of those. What other sort of faults could there be in an introduction? It doesn't have any relation to what follows. Yeah. Sometimes people just tell a joke, don't they? I detest that. No, I, don't, I don't detest humour, but I detest just telling a joke sort of to get in with the people. It's got no relation to what follows. What other faults could an introduction have? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to bring them from where they are, wherever they happens to be, at least into the subject. Gentlemen, an introduction is just the slip road that gets you down onto the motorway. It is nothing else at all. It is not a country road. It is not a, a scenic route. It is not a mystery tour. It's just getting people from where they are as quickly and as efficiently as possible into the subject. What difficulties might you have in preparing an introduction? What's really hard about this? What on earth does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're quite right, I'm teasing, sorry. Yeah, you've got to be very clear about what you're trying to do. So here's this man who is arrived early for an appointment. He's a businessman. And he sits in the corridor and he falls asleep. And along comes the secretary and gently wakes him up and leads him by the arm into the room where the business will take place. What is the lady's name? Mrs. Introduction. That's all an introduction does. It gently wakes you up, takes you by the hand, and leads you into the place where the business will take place. Okay, that we need an introduction. Then the second element in all sermons should be what people have called in history a discussion. Why is that a bad name? What is it? It's a proclamation. So why on earth have they called it a discussion? Right, okay. Do you feel that this is a bit of a discussion? Is it? Is it? Why isn't it? Okay, so a sermon is a discussion in the sense that you're discussing the subject and you're trying to draw people in but actually it is a monologue, it's a proclamation, but historically it's been called a discussion. You've got a certain amount of truth which you're going to teach to these people now. That's what the discussion is. That's the main body of the sermon. It must have a plan. Why? Precisely, you'll just wander, wander, wander. I like driving on British roads. What do we have on British roads that most countries don't have? Cameras. <laughs> Speed cameras. <laughs> Pardon? Yes, but we have something at night in particular. Cat size. They come into they come into focus one at a time, don't they? And as long as you follow the next cat's eye and the next one and the next one and the next one, you'll, you never miss the road. You just, wherever it turns, wherever it goes, you just stay on the road as long as you can see the next point, the next point, the next point, and the next point. And you've got to have a plan where you're laying out the truth in a certain order and you know exactly how you're going to take the people along. Historically, people have found it easier to have divisions or headings. Why? I listen to a preacher fairly regularly who obviously has a plan but he has no headings no points, no divisions memorable why must it be memorable? 
That won't do them any good. And who else won't it do any good? Pardon? Right. And who else won't it do any good to? Precisely, yeah. Because the purpose of preaching is not that they might learn, but that they might teach. Isn't it? To teach faithful men who will teach others also. And if you preach a sermon just so that the people in front of you will learn, it, you're a dead duck. The purpose of preaching is to preach in such a way that they will learn so that they can teach in turn. And it's pretty hard to do that if you haven't got points. On my outline, you'll see I've got some rules about points. Each one should be distinct. Can you see it on the outline? Right, from the others. I wonder if you've ever been to the seaside and you see these sort of photo booths where there are people in traditional costume. Well, they're not people, they're only pictures of people, but there's no head. Do you know what I'm talking about? And you still stand there with your head there and they take your picture and it looks like you're dressed in some traditional costume. And then comes along a completely different family and they stick their head in the appropriate point and they take their picture and it looks like they're in historical costume. And in fact, every photo is the same except just for the, the detail of the particular faces. Why on earth am I using that illustration? Preaching can be like that. Some, some points in a sermon very often are just like that. They're just a rehash of the previous one with, and a rehash of the previous one. Points need to be distinct. Now there needs to be order and movement and progress. Ah. What were those three words? Order, movement and progress. Now tell me about a merry-go-round. Which of those does it have? Order, yes? Movement? Progress. Now tell me about a rioting mob. A rioting mob. <coughs> Possibly? Or? I don't think a rioting mob has order, movement and progress. What does it have? Movement? Progress? Possibly? What does an army have? Right, what do you want your sermon points to be? Order, movement and progress. The points should be cumulative. What is... Well, what does that mean? Yeah. A falling object, I'm told. My father used to try and tell me this constantly. We used to go to endless wells and sort of drop stones down and he would then work out on his slide ruler, yes, that's what they used in those days, and how deep the well was because the thing fell at, fell at 32.2 feet per second per second. I said, Dad, why do you say per second per second? Why did he say per second per second? It's accelerating all the time. So it's actually building up its speed. I'm told that if you drop a coin from the top of the Empire State Building and it fell on a pedestrian, it would kill them. Is it true or not? <laughs> it's, it, apparently it's not true, but I'm sure that if I dropped a half brick from the top of the Empire State Building on someone, it would probably kill them. But it probably wouldn't kill them if I dropped it from two inches. Why am I using that illustration? Yeah, it doesn't. So the thing should be moving along and carrying some increasing in force as it, as it goes on. These points should be natural. What do I mean by that? They've got to come out of the passage so that when people reread the passage they say, ah, oh, I can see that there. Ah, oh, I can see that there. Where on earth did you get that third point from? Spurgeon tells the story about someone who want, thought that all sermons had to have three points and he gave one point and then he gave the next point and then he said, well, here's a few thoughts about the woman of Samaria, which was, which was nothing to do with his subject apparently at all. What happens if I had a 15-point sermon? Why? 
most people can't remember 15 things, can they? Have you ever played that game where you have a, a tray and it's got all these objects on? Kim's game, I think they call it, and you have to remember how it's... Some of you can do it, can't you? I know a man who knows the whole book of Psalms off by heart. He learnt it with some code that he's got in his head about how to remember things. But I can't remember the whole book of Psalms off by heart. Can you? Most of us can't. But we can remember... What were those three words I used earlier on about... What were they that you recited? There were three. If there had been seven, how many of you would have remembered? Hardly anybody. What happens if I have too few points? Just two, for example. If there's two in the passage, that's all I can have. But what... Okay. Yeah, exactly. What is a syllogism? Mr. Harding, what is a syllogism? <laughs> syllogism is the simplest form of logic. Let's go. All postmen wear blue trousers. John is a postman. Therefore, John wears blue trousers. And you can have them actually logical sequence which you can see if you've got three points. It's almost impossible if you only have two. Don't mock people who have three points. When I was a boy, bird nesting was permitted. We had a quite a collection of bird's eggs in our house because I had a large number of brothers. But if we ever brought a bird's egg home, my parents would say, how many eggs were in the nest? And if we said seven, my parents were happy. But if we said four, they were unhappy. Because, like many people of their generation, they had this theory that birds can only count up to four. So if you took the seventh egg, the bird wouldn't notice. <laughs> but if you took the fourth egg, the bird would be upset. Right or wrong, I've no idea. But I think it's pretty true of humans. Most people can count up to three or four and remember the sermon, but after that they get a bit stuck. Now let's come back to proportionate. Why proportionate? Pardon? Yes. And the human soul is constructed in such a way that you will remember three proportionate or four proportionate points in a way that you'll not remember a big point and a couple of smaller ones. And they should be persuasive. When Jesus says that you've got to fast, does he say, you've got to fast, but don't do it like this? Or does he say, don't do it like this, but do it like this. Can you see the difference? Does he say positive, negative, or does he say negative, positive? When Jesus talks about prayer, does he say, do it like this, but not like this? Or does he say, don't do it like this, but do it like this? Which does he do? First the negative, then the positive. Question. What's the question going to be? Why? Why? <laughs> Why? What would be the effect if you did the other way around? Almost takes you backwards. Thank you very much. That's the best answer I've ever had, I think, for that one. Because... There is a way of persuading and one of the ways of persuading is do the negative before the positive. Do the abstract before the concrete. Do the false before the true. Do the statement before the exhortation. Think about the preaching which persuades you or the conversations which persuade you. Take it to bits. See how it's done. Ask whether it ties up with scripture and then copy it. And... Our point should be attractively put. What on earth am I getting at?
Yeah. In 1962, how many years ago is that? Yes. In London, I heard a sermon on the prodigal son. This was his outline. Sick of home. Homesick. Home. What do you think of that? It is brilliant. I can remember it 46 years later. I also remember one who said he lost his togs, he went to the hogs and he ate with the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody else, lost his togs, he went to the dogs and he ate with the hogs. Yeah, that's right, yes. yes. I think also it was his spurning, his yearning and his returning. And <sighs> but I remember the easy one. Yeah. That's, that's what I call attractively put. Yeah. I used to listen to a, a preacher on the radio quite a lot. And he used to have these long points, all of which began with P. So the, the power of his protruding and passionate prayer would be followed by... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember any of it, except it began with P. And it was not attractively put. What's the effect of a point put in a question? Isn't it amazing how many preachers teach in propositions? What's a proposition? Just a statement. And never preach in, in questions. So all their points are statements, but none of their, their points are, are questions. What am I trying to do in this three quarters of an hour? Make you think about structure, right? Then a sermon must have a conclusion. Why? And then, yes, yeah, so one day driving through North Wales, we came to the little village of Dolwood Ellen. Have you ever been there? Where we found a chocolate factory. Amazing, isn't it? Hidden away in a little village. There was just one person worked in the chocolate factory. He, he was Swiss. He was a chocolatier, and, that, that's where he, and he worked in North Wales. And he made all his chocolates by hand. And... And he showed us round and how the chocolates were made and it was fascinating. So out of a sense of duty, we thought we'd better buy some. It cost 50 pence each. And this is years ago. So how many do you think we bought? Well, we didn't, bought, we didn't just buy one. We actually bought six. And this man, he got these precious chocolates which he treated by like children, of course, because he had made them. And he put them in his brightly coloured bag which he then tied up with a nice piece of string then he handed it to my wife. Why am I telling you that? <coughs> exactly. It was precious. And he wanted us to carry, carry away his precious goods and not lose any of it. And that little bag was the conclusion of our visit. And that's what sermons need. I think that some... Preachers study near spindriers. Spindriers going at full speed, isn't it? And then suddenly you're just aware that it's not quite going quite so fast, and then it's it's going a bit slower, and then it's getting a bit slower, and then you're wondering, has it stopped yet? Ever heard a sermon like that? And he's going full belt, and then you're just aware he's just losing it a little bit. And he's slowing down, and the only moment of suspense is, has he finished? <laughs> and I better look at that clock right now. Far better, isn't it, to shoot an arrow. And the arrow has a clear aim. It's got three or four feathers on it to keep it on direction. Do you follow my meaning? And then it hits you, but it'll fall off unless it's sharpened. And it could be sharpened with a word of comfort or sharpened with a word of duty or sharpened by a reminder of a promise or sharpened with some exciting scriptural truth. But the whole power of the arrow means that all its momentum and all its direction is focused at that moment on its point. And if it's got that point, then, of course, it does its work, which can be killing, 
or whatever. Sermons without a clear conclusion don't do their work. Now, finally, let's pretend that I am not the, non <coughs> the full-blooded, unashamed nonconformist that I am. Let's pretend that I'm an Anglican. Any Ang well, we won't say anything about that today, because some of you might be. Let's say I'm an Anglican who's designing a church building, and I'm going to put a spire on it. At what point will I plan the spire? Right at the beginning. When will I build the spire? But I will have it in my mind all the way through the designing and the building. That will be in my mind. It will be the first in conception and the last in execution. Is my point made? Well, you shake your head if it isn't. And it's an, it's an outstandingly helpful question to finish with. That's the point of the exegetical accuracy. We labour away at the text until we know what the text means. By text, I don't necessarily mean verse. It could be a passage or a, a few verses. Once we've got an understanding of the, what the verse means and we understand what truth, therefore, we're going to teach from it, then I think our conclusion, where do we want to end, people to end up, will be clear. But we don't lose sight of that conclusion. We keep that conclusion in the mind, in our mind, all the way through the preparation of the actual sermon that then comes from that, from that passage of scripture. Yes. Yep. Yes. In fact, they build on two things: we read the Bible and we read the human soul, and we try and get that word into those people and realize that structure is the best way of doing it. Please think about structure. If you hear sermons, because some of you will never preach, ask yourself, did it have a structure? If you preach occasionally, make sure it has a structure. And if you preach, if it's going to be your life work, and I trust that it will be for some of you, please have structure, because that does honour to God and is a demonstration of love to your people. We'll stop there for now. We'll read from Matthew's Gospel. And we'll read in chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now verse 24 of the next chapter.
Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was. When Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So how did the scribes teach? Without authority. So how did they teach? What was their method? Pardon? Dictating to? Anything? Just repeating laws. Not usually the law of Moses, but their own commentary on the law. It was just proposition, proposition. Rabbi Hillel says this, Rabbi Gamal says that. da 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 they didn't have authority the authority of course was the authority of the son of God which is unique but there is an authority which comes through following a biblical method and one of them is putting eyes into people's ears whose expression is that? not mine putting eyes into people's ears who first used that expression? yes not Spurgeon. Go back a bit. Before him. After him. <laughs> a bit more modern than that. 1517, 31st of October. Martin Luther. It was his expression. He said when he preached, he didn't preach to the intellectual or the academic or the nobles or the lords. He preached to the children he had this imaginary 12-year-old girl in his congregation to whom he always preached and that was his expression, putting eyes into people's ears. Who should you speak to? The congregation you'd like to have or the congregation you have? Obviously. So let's talk about the value of illustrations. Look at the word, illustration. What word do you see in it? What word do you see in the word illustration? Illusion. Illusion. Bang, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> luster. What is luster? Light. So, light is shed upon something. Illustrations are just windows. That's all they are. Nothing else. They're just windows that let the light in. What would the room be like without windows? And that's the way most people are. That's the way the human soul mostly operates. In other words, if people can't see it, they can't see it. And I'm not talking about seeing visual aids, because I'm not actually a great believer in visual aids for all sorts of reasons. But the fact still remains is that real men, real women, women real boys, real girls, are poor at abstract reasoning. What on earth is abstract reasoning? Yes, so I'm going to talk to you today about the disteleological surge. What does that mean to you? Nothing at all, does it? I'm going to talk to you about pigs and the shape of their noses. Now, immediately, there's a different reaction. Ordinary people, real people, are not good at theory. They're not good at theoretical reasoning. They're not good at deep, sustained argument. But they are good at visual thinking. And the best illustration you can give them is the one they take away in their head. How will you get a picture into their head? Through the ear. That's the point. So we use words to put pictures into people's heads. So we're putting eyes into people's ears. 
So, yeah, right. Question. What is the longest... I'm going to get this wrong, but it doesn't matter. What is the longest serving radio program on BBC? The Archers. Actually, it's not statistically true, but it's the second longest. But we won't... <laughs> What's the longest? It's the news, yeah. <laughs> what is the Archers? Pardon? A family of ordinary people living in an ordinary... Now, I know the people under, people under 30 you haven't a clue what I'm talking about, have you? <laughs> but you have to ask the question, how is it that a radio broadcast, which was popular when I was young, it still gathers several million listeners every day? What does it do? What is the Archers? It's a story about ordinary people doing reasonably ordinary things in an ordinary village in ordinary times. So it continues to capture people because it is an illustration. Now, you may not like the current culture. You may not like the fact that people are poor at theoretical reasoning. You may not like the fact that folk can't follow theoretical, abstract logic. You may not like that, but God called you to live in 2008. He didn't call you to live in the time of Erasmus, whenever that was, or in the time of Anselm, or in the time of Cicero, he called you to live today. And he called you to live here today. It's not an accident. It's part of an eternal decree. You've got to communicate with the real people in the real situation in which they're in. That's the value of illustrations. Imagine a football match. See, imagine. On the television, which is being commented on, but the floodlights are not on on the field. Can you imagine that? Ridiculous, isn't it? You've got to see something and then the commentary makes sense. So that's the value of illustrations. Now let's talk about a bit more. They explain. Jesus could have said, whatever you've done, however bad it is, however long you've been doing it, you can come back to the Father. What did he say? Yeah, a certain man had two sons and the elder said to his father and immediately the whole thing is much clearer than if it was just given in propositions. Have you ever read the book of Romans? How many illustrations are there in the book of Romans? One? At least. When Paul is trying to explain to ordinary people why it's ridiculous to be saved by grace but continue to live in sin, he could have done it by a whole series of abstract theoretical arguments. But what does he do? In fact, he talks about someone who's a slave who's dead to one master but alive to another. He talks about a slave market where you can tell which slave belongs to which master by looking at who he obeys. He talks about a marriage where one person dies. And immediately the, the truth becomes, becomes clear. And the illustration immediately has a certain argumentative force, which it would not have otherwise. The truth also becomes attractive. Now, have you ever been travelled on a motorway? What's it like travelling on a motorway? Boring. Boring, tedious. Let's have a couple of other adjectives. Monotonous. Fast. Fast. Slow. Slow. <laughs> <laughs> Tiring. What happens when you've been on the motorway two or three hours? How do you feel? You feel tired. It's, it's just the same old thing, and it's not like driving through the countryside. It's just the same old thing, the same old thing, the same old thing. The only, the only relief you get is by being an eddy spotter. Are you an eddy spotter? Yeah. What's your record? <laughs> hmm? In one day? In one day. 
Oh, well, our record's only 39. I feel very ashamed now. <laughs> but it's the same old thing. So what do you do? You pull over. Well, I hope you don't do that. What do you do? You stop. Well, you go to the services, don't you? You go to the toilet. You go and have a cup of tea or coffee. You, you look around the shop. And then what? How do you feel now? You feel, re re you feel refreshed. And yet... All that's happened, actually, is that you've stopped and done something slightly different, and now, actually, after a little while, you're anxious to get going again. And if you're in a normal family, there's already somebody in the, in the, in the family saying, can't we get going again? Come on, can't we get going? And that's what illustrations do. You're taking people through a series of truths, and then they begin to tire and fatigue. Just a simple illustration, a little bit of a rest, something slightly different, and they're not only... Um, rested, but they're, they're actually willing and eager to keep going, get going again. Now, we lived in Switzerland, believe it or not, for many years. Most people in Switzerland live in what sort of house? High-rise flats, you're right. <laughs> they have lifts. Do you know, wonder of wonders, the lifts hardly ever break down. And if they do, they're usually mended within about 90 minutes. That's Switzerland. But let's say you didn't take the lift and you went up the stairs. Between every floor there are two flights of stairs. This is always true. And what do you find on the landing? A seat. So you go up the flight of stairs and sit down, and then you go up another flight of stairs and sit down, and it's easy. You can go up 14, 16, 18, 20, 25, and actually get there quite fresh at the top simply because you stopped it and then started again and stopped and started again. That's what illustrations do in a sermon. Did you notice how I taught that? By illustrations. And they make the truth memorable. And that's why uh, we must be careful with our illustrations. When I was a young minister, the local hospital contacted me. What am I doing now? And they said, Mr. Ollier, you're new, aren't you? I said, yes. They said, you're not only new in the area, you're new as a minister, aren't you? They said, yes. Well, we've got a special project on. I don't think it's ever been repeated. We would like you to come and be present at a post-mortem of a smoker. Because we know that ministers have influence in the community and we would like you to be present at a post-mortem so you could see what tobacco smoke does to lungs. I didn't accept. <laughs> I know myself too well. I would have fallen either across the patient or probably might have had two post-mortems. This I'm sure of. If I had been there and seen what tobacco smoke does to lungs, it would have had infinitely more impression on me than all the statistics which I've read since. So, we can get through to people, we can make the truth attractive, we can make it have a certain argumentative force, we can make it memorable, simply by using illustration. So, here's a question. Why, that's my favourite question, do so few preachers use illustrations? And there could be a number of reasons. It's hard to come up with them. Fear of diluting the word. Fear of, dis of them being a distraction. They don't plan to put them in. They get a sense of completion because they've got all their material ready. They say, ah, oh, I've got a message but they've not actually thought about how they will get it in permanently into the minds of the boys and girls and men and women in front of them. Any other reason? Lack of imagination. It's extremely hard work. Laboring away at the original text, especially if you know the original languages, is extremely hard work. But actually, laboring away at illustrations, fresh, relevant illustrations, is also extremely hard work in some respects, very, very much harder. 
but we follow Christ, or do we? Christ was a preacher. He sent his apostles out to preach. He, did a, he had a way of preaching. Someone was complaining in the, I think, Evangelical Times or Evangelical Now, um, th this summer, that they'd read dozens of books on preaching and they'd never read anything upon how our Lord preached. Well, that was their fault because there are books available on that subject. I wrote one, but don't tell me what it is. <laughs> but the fact is, we do follow our Lord Jesus Christ, and he did teach in a certain way, and if you put together all that he said, how much of it do you think would be illustration? The majority, exactly. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the most propositional of all his sermons, a third of it is illustration. But what did he normally, how did he normally preach? Parables. In fact, the Gospels go for so far as to say, without a parable, he said to them, nothing. Our Lord always used an illustration. Why? One reason was some, so that some people wouldn't understand and only searchers after truth would. Yeah. But that what would the searchers after truth find? They would find that the truth was clear and memorable and attractive and had a certain argumentative force. Now, let's talk about rugby and let's talk about football. Do you know the difference? <coughs> hmm? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the rugby and this is the football. Shape of the ball? That's rugby, I think, isn't it? This, uh, which one have I done now? Right, this is rugby, this is football. Right. Shape of the ball? Uh, ovalish, round. Right, that's the difference. Other differences? 15, 11, except in real rugby, we have 13. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. Any other differences? Pick up and run. Pick up and run? Can't get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They say this is a game for hooligans played by gentlemen, and this is a game for gentlemen played by hooligans. You've heard that one before. So, any other differences? Time of the halves, and the goals. Right, now similarity. People run around. Played on grass, played on balls, kick a ball. Somebody gets punched. <laughs> there are two teams, there are goals. There are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. What language am I speaking? What language am I speaking? Yeah. Oral English. Oral English is not literary English. Literary English is not oral, oral English. There are similarities. There are great points of overlap. But they are not the same phenomenon. Give me some differences. Hmm? Brackets. Okay. So there are great differences of syntax. In other words, the way the sentences are put together. Now let's forget the grammar and forget the syntax. What is the real big difference between that and that? This is literary, this is oral. And if you can't get the meaning with this, this is literary. Yeah. Okay, so you've got tone here. But how about this side? Literally. What happens if I can't understand the sentence? I can read it again. And if I still can't understand it, I can read it again. And if I still can't understand it, get someone to explain it, or I can look up in the dictionary, or whatever. Oral English. If I don't understand it, and it's a sermon, you've had it. Haven't you? 
which is why they've got to get it first time. And the only way they will get it first time is by being highly illustrative. Right, that's something to do with the value of illustrations. Number two, sources of illustration. Where do you get them from? Yeah, why? It's absolutely full of them. How much of the Bible is narrative? What is narrative? Story or history. How much of the Bible is narrative? 10%? 40%? 60%? I don't know either. <laughs> but it's a lot, isn't it? All those historical books, the Gospels and vast parts of the, of the, the prophets is narrative. It's a major feature of the Bible that there is narrative in it and therefore we can use it. It's a self-interpreting book and it's a self-illustrating book. In the Bible you've got history, you've got biography. What's the difference between history and biography? Yeah, based, well, not necessarily personal opinion, but it's the, it's the history of people, isn't it? You've got poetry. Does poetry have illustrations in? You've got Proverbs. Any illustration in Proverbs? Yes, because I think someone once said at Hyde Park Corner, there's not a word of truth in the Bible. And the fellow says, it says here, the rigging of the nose brings forth blood. Let's see if that's true. <laughs> Scripture. However, if you read Spurgeon, he talks about half-shaven beards and the valley of Baker or Barker. And if, if I preached today and talked about half-shaven beards, what would be the ap what would be the reaction? <laughs> what is the fellow talking about? And are you in the valley of Barker? <laughs> <laughs> So we can't always do it as they did it. We may have to explain or actually tell the story to which we're referring um, because we're, we're not in the Puritan era and we're not in 19th century London where Spurgeon was. But there is the Bible and I'd like to see more people illustrating from the Bible because it kills two birds with one stone which is also an illustration. Another source of illustration is observation. There is a petrol pump which never runs dry, isn't there? There's a bank account where you can always write as many checks as you like, isn't there? Yeah. There's a tap which if you turn it on, the water never stops flowing, isn't there? And what is it? It's observation. Name some of the things which our Lord saw, which he used in his teaching. Just give me a dozen. Wait, wait, one at a time. So, uh, widows might... Fig tree. Sorry, I thought you said victory. Sorry. <laughs> the sky. Child. Lilies. Birds. Dog. Yeah. Water. Events. Weddings. Funerals. What was our Lord's most complicated illustration? Um, the unjust servant, <laughs> possibly. It's very hard to find a complicated illustration. There are one or two in our Lord. Very, very hard. They're nearly all things which he saw and then he used to teach the people. And if you read our Lord's teaching, you'll have a good picture of life in first century Palestine. Now, Spurgeon, what century did he live in? Where did he live? And if you read his illustrations, you'll get a good picture of 19th century London. He talks about gaslights. He talks about a man going off to buy a pair of ducks who came into the church on, the, on, on his way. He talks about the, the great exhibition of 1859. He talks about Queen Victoria. He talks about cobble streets and hansom cabs. But we're not in 19th century London. We're in 21st century, wherever you happen to come from. What sort of things do people today see? Every day of the week, what do they see? 
Give me a few examples of what people... Mobile phones? Pardon? Sport? Computers? TV? Advertising? Let's have a few more. What are the objects that people see every day? Cars? Jet planes, yeah. When did you last hear a sermon, tell me honestly, which used these sort of things to illustrate the point? Or are we still relating Spurgeon's sermons about... I remember Spurgeon telling a story about a man who, who was selling a pair of ducks. <laughs> Do you know anybody who's ever sold a pair of ducks, by the way? No, I don't either. I know plenty of people who've eaten them. Observation, observation, observation. It's all around us all the time. And these are sources of illustration. Now, let's talk about pure invention. Would it be right to tell a story which is purely invented? Justify your answer. Jesus did it. What are the dangers of inventing a story and telling it? Could be too far fetched. Yeah, that, is, that is certainly true, but so we'll have to come come back to that. It might do. Yeah, you must be careful to keep underlining the fact that this is an invented story, otherwise they might think that you, your mother-in-law really did die and you brought her home on the roof rack. <laughs> I've heard that story several times, that's why I mentioned it. Yeah. I don't know what it's supposed to illustrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I found great help over the years in inventing, inventing stories. I have a terrific illustration which I thought I'd invented, and then I decided to reread The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee just to see whether I still disagreed with it, which I do. And... Lo and behold, the story which I've been using for 40 years, which I thought I'd invented, it's in there. But it proves the effect of a good story nonetheless. It's a story about a man who falls into a dirty puddle and then walks home to, towards a street light. Do you know that story? Yeah, well, it's in my book on Romans. Yeah, I'm doing a, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of advertising today because I was told off the other day for never doing it. Right. Where else would you get illustrations from? Go on. What's really missing off there? Personal experience? There's a danger in illustrating from personal experience, isn't there? Because you're always talking about yourself. <laughs> the people's experiences, yeah? Yeah, we could pull that back in. You might know that you've got people working in offices or farms and you could perhaps invent scenarios and but we're about people in offices and farms and pull that in. But there's one classic, classic omission on that sheet about sources of illustration. The news, I was thinking of something even more obvious. Come on, lads. The internet. Man is sinful, horribly sinful. The internet's filled with sin. But it's filled with good things too, isn't it? So, you can find out all sorts of things. I heard the great story of the Bible on the, on the, on the bounty. Do you know this story? But I just couldn't remember the story. I went up in the internet, and there it was, the whole story told by five or six different people. I had to knock out a few details because there were a few contradictions in the stories. But it's a terrific story. I could never have told it again if it hadn't been for the internet. On the other hand, I heard a fellow who, who took a... Who took a serve, uh, took, he led the service and he led it like a baby. Then he preached this mighty sermon about high schools and sneakers. And I thought, where on earth did he get high school from? You know? Do you have high schools in your area? Oh, yeah, some people do. Sneakers, do you wear sneakers? Do you know what they are? Sneakers, in my vocabulary, are people who go around telling tales about others. But. <laughs> And of course, there was a fellow who'd just taken it lock, stock and barrel, hey, that's an illustration, um, off the internet and was even using a vocabulary which wasn't appropriate. You've got to be careful with the internet. But it's a marvellous resource. 
Which, year, which century did God call you to live in? This one. Is the internet an accident? Is Christ the Lord of the internet? Of course. It's, how much truth on the internet is Christ's truth? All of it. Note what I said. How much truth on the internet is Christ's truth? All truth is God's truth. And it's a marvellous resource which you've got, you've got access to. And I'm not saying go up to this website and this website where they've got 63,000 illustrations on temptation. I'm not saying necessarily that there are such search engines and, and such sites. Now then, what makes a good illustration, however? Because my problem in life actually now is not finding illustrations, but knowing which ones to select. It's a happy position to be in. I never used to be like that. I used to just go around scratching, trying to think, how could I illustrate this? How could I illustrate it? But I don't have that, seem to have that problem anymore. What makes a good illustration? Well, let's put it around the other way. What makes a bad illustration? Not interesting. Not relevant? Actually, aside from the point, doesn't teach the truth. I took some kids years ago to see the Mona Lisa. Have you heard of the Mona Lisa? A sort of ugly painting in Paris. They say it's the most beautiful smile ever, but I'm not convinced myself. She looks decidedly sarcastic to me. <laughs> anyway, I took a dozen kids to see the Mona Lisa. And when they came back, what did they talk about? They talked about the special cameras and the sensors, so that if you even touch the painting, the whole museum closed down and the automatically closing doors, so that if you touch the painting, you're actually locked in the room where the painting was. And they talked about all the security measures and not the thing that I wanted them to see. What happens sometimes in a sermon? You've got this terrific thing that you want everyone to see, but in fact they don't see that at all. They see all the other sorts of things um, which surround it, and they don't actually see what you're getting at. The first rule of every illustration, gentlemen, is it has to be subordinate. In other words, it has to serve the truth. Now, we are Westerners. In the West, this is how most preachers preach. They preach the proposition, then they illustrate it. I don't think that's wrong. But I don't think it's necessarily the best. In many other parts of the world, you would need to give the illustration first and then draw out the proposition. Please remember that. You don't always have to say, here's the truth, now let me illustrate. Why not put the illustration first and then draw out the truth? But it must be subordinate. Now I'm going to illustrate the doctrine of the Trinity. Can I? Right, so how can I illustrate the doctrine of the Trinity? Three are one and one are three. Yeah, which is the classic one. It's been used for a thousand years. H2O is sometimes a solid, ice. Sometimes it's a liquid, water. And sometimes it's a gas, steam. Good illustration or bad? But they're all H2O. Yeah, the only problem is that any given molecule at any given moment is not solid, liquid and gas at the same time. So in fact you're teaching an old heresy called Sabellianism or modalism by which you say sometimes God appears like this, sometimes he appears like this and sometimes he appears like this. Whereas the scripture teaches that all of God is the Father, all of God is the Son, all of God is the Holy Spirit and the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But I have used the illustration to show what? Yes. <laughs> so, God is not like anything, is he? So, you, you can't actually illustrate the threeness and oneness of God. 
but you can use the illustration to show that the illustration is defective, to show part of the truth, but to show that actually God is not like anything. Yes? No, they are like it. Him. So we, we can see his handwriting, if you like. We can see aspects of the Godhood, the Godhead, in all sorts of his creation. But at the end of the day, you cannot illustrate three in one and one in three, but you can point people in that direction. Yes, okay, so I probably overstated it. Yeah. Yes. So no illustration is the total truth, is it? It's an aspect of it. Okay, very good. Illustrations need to be clear. I went to hear a student. He's now a respected gospel minister. He started off his, illus- he started off his sermon by talking about the Great Pyramid. <coughs> he was talking to West Wales farmers and their wives who had never heard of the Great Pyramid. He was sufficiently discerning after two or three minutes to realize that nobody had a clue what he was talking about. But it was on his notes, wasn't it? So he gave them a short explanation of the Great Pyramid. And then he talked about the geometry of the Great Pyramid and some of its features. And uh, and then, I haven't a clue what he was trying to illustrate. (laughs) But the point was he went on and on and on and on and on about the Great Pyramid. He preached for 35 minutes and 10 minutes of it was about the Great Pyramid. That was disproportionate and did not actually help very much at all. So, illustrations have to be subordinate, they have to be clear, and they have to be brief. Have you ever listened to two ladies talking? If there's ladies listening to this talk, this is about you. (laughs) Have you ever listened to two ladies talking? It's fascinating. Sit in a bus and listen to two ladies talking. He said to him, and she said to her, and then he said, and then she said, and then they said, and then they said back, and after a while you realise that the he and the he and the he is not the same he, and the she and the she and the she is not the same she, and there's several lots of they. And all the women have understood. (laughs) But the men haven't. So keep it subordinate, clear, and brief and dignified there's a famous American preacher who uses illustrations which are very very near the mark near the mark is an illustration do you understand the expression near the mark what's the effect of an undignified illustration and put people off, so they think, fancy a man of God saying a thing like that, so he loses credibility, or it dis- distracts their minds and makes them think about undignified things, and unfortunately that's the sort of thing that they remember, and the whole thing is out of sync. You're trying to teach something which is holy, and pure, and good, and noble, and true and you try to illustrate it from something which isn't that. And you must be very careful with that sort of illustration, indeed, because you can actually cheapen and tarnish the truth by the wrong sort of illustration. And they should be varied. Spurgeon once said in a lecture, in a sermon, no, in a lecture, to men who couldn't illustrate, if all you had in your room was one candle you would have enough illustrations for many sermons. What was the reaction of the students? They laughed. So a couple of weeks later, Spurgeon stood up and he gave a whole lecture on illustrations from candles. And then the week after that, he stood up and he gave another lecture full of illustrations on candles, which was published as a book, Sermons on Candles. Now imagine a preacher who stands up and every single illustration for 40 minutes is to to do with candles. He'd be diagnosed with compulsive obsessive disorder, wouldn't he? (laughs) 
What am I driving at? Illustrations need to be varied. I worship a God who painted all the colours of the rainbow. And when I get to heaven, I expect to see even more colours than that. I, inv I worship a God who, as I drive through the countryside, no green is like any other green. I worship a God who has constructed the universe in such a way that on the photocopier I use most, there are a million combinations of colour. I worship a God who made spring, summer, autumn, winter, always in that order, with that constant variety and that constant sameness. I worship a God who, when he made man in his image, made no two faces the same. Not even identical twins are really identical. God is filled with variety. And therefore, if I'm going to preach his word, there's got to be variety in the pictures also which I paint in people's minds. And finally, they must be accurate. I gave a terrific illustration once, if I, may dare, if I dare to say so, about the order of the planets. And there's the sun, and there's these different planets. And as I was giving this illustration, making this marvellous point, some people were going... And afterwards, as soon as I got to the door, there was a long queue <laughs> of intellectuals. And of course, I got the order of the planets wrong, hadn't I? So, what had I done to myself? Shot myself in the foot. Because in the areas where they could check up on me, I hadn't told them the truth. And therefore, in the areas where they couldn't check up on me, there was no doubt. We must make sure, therefore, that our illustrations are accurate. But don't forget the power of an illustration. Does a baby cry to be born? Or does it cry because it is born? Does a sinner say, God be merciful to me, a sinner, so that they can be regenerated, or because they are regenerated? are regenerated. You could stand before a congregation for 20 minutes and explain that truth, but a couple of sentences about a baby would illustrate it for the vast majority of your people in a way that they would never forget, or at least that they would think about. So I want to ask you to illustrate, 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 illustrate. If you have the lights on so bright, people are dazzled. They still can't see. If the illustrations are so marvellous that they're like chandeliers, people will say, oh, what great chandeliers, what wonderful illustrations. Plenty of illustrations, not too many, not too fancy, but every single sermon on the pavement and in the pulpit should end at least by people saying, ha, I can see what he's getting at. First of all, we'll read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, and verse 14. And when he had called all the multitude to him, he said to them, Hear me, everyone and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated? 
thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. A couple of opening comments. The first is to say that there is a difference between a critical spirit and a, and a critical faculty. <coughs> I say this because tomorrow most of us are going to listen to preaching. And you've had a day on preaching and you'll say he didn't do this and he didn't do this and he did this and he didn't do this. And you have to remember that for everything that God does there is a counterfeit. A critical spirit and a critical faculty are not the same thing. A critical faculty is God's gift to you. That's by which you weigh things up and you decide that this is good, this is not so good, this is better, this is worse, this is bad, this is thoroughly bad, and you're weighing up the value of things in the light of God's word. That's a critical faculty. The scripture commands you to use it. A critical spirit is where you look at a preacher, for example, or listen to a preacher, and you say, he didn't do this, and he did do this, and he didn't do this, and he didn't do this, and in fact you are evaluating him with a view to judging him and belittling him. That, Scripture forbids you to do. So we are talking about preaching and what's good preaching and what's bad preaching. Not so that we can sit there with our arms folded and think, hmm, 7 out of 10 for him and 9 out of 10 for him. But so that we can really, genuinely work out what's good and what's bad and learn from it for the glory of God. But not with a view to belittling any man of God. I hope that's clear. So that was, I think, an important comment. Now, I have a thousand things to say about preaching, at least. And the Lord gives me life and sanity, because I need both. I hope to write a little bit more about this. But I listen to a lot of preaching. Most of the preaching I hear is exegetically, more or less, accurate. Though some of it is hair-raising. But most of it is exegetically accurate. That's why I haven't spoken about that this afternoon. And most of what I hear is, is doctrinally substantial. Some of it's so substantial it's like porridge with lumps in. <laughs> But that's why I'm not talking about that this afternoon. But I hear loads of preaching that has no structure, loads of preaching that has no application, and loads of preaching that has no illustration, or very little. So that's why I've chosen these three subjects. So now I'm going to talk about tailoring the message, this whole question of application. Where the application begins, the sermon begins says the old proverb. Now I want you to imagine a tailor. That's why I call it tailoring the message. This tailor makes cloth. So let's look at the different threads from which his cloth is made. There's not a flaw in any thread. That's what we call exegetical accuracy. He weaves it into really substantial stuff. You can really feel the quality of it, unlike this. That's what we call doctrinal substance. It has a beautiful pattern on it, also not like this. And that's what we call, of course, clear structure. And you can see for yourself just what beautiful colours it is. And that's what we call vivid illustration. Has the tailor done his job? No good if it doesn't fit. And this cloth which he's woven has got to fit this man, this woman, this boy, this girl, this teenager. It's got to fit the particular people whom he's dealing with 
so that they can actually wear it all week. And I'm afraid there's a lot of sermons where most of the tailor's work is done, but the fitting, the cutting to shape, is never done so that they cannot wear the truth of God in their daily life. That's why I'm speaking now, therefore, about tailoring the message. So we're talking about pointed application. Pointed application. My job as a preacher is to supply the spiritual needs of you and you and you and you. All of you. That's the job of the preacher. To take this passage and under God's blessing to present it in such a way that you put it on in the school and you put it on in the factory and you put it on in the farm and you put it on in the family or wherever you may find yourself. So, number one, what pointed application is? And I've... I like this, this definition by Broadus, so I'll give it to you. Who was J.A. Broadus? Anybody got any idea at all? I suppose I ought to ask an American if there were any present. J.A. Broadus was a powerful preacher in the southern United States in the 19th century. He wrote a classic book on preaching, on the preparation and delivery of sermons. It's a real hard read. I read it once, or twice, certainly once, and then on the last page he says, you can forget everything I've said if you've got passion. I thought, why didn't I read the last page first? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's a brilliant book, and this is what he says. Application in the strict sense is that part or those parts of the discourse in which we show how the subject applies to the person's addressed what practical instructions it offers them, what practical demands it makes upon them. I think that's a pretty, pretty important um, definition. Who was Daniel Webster? He did write a dictionary. Which dictionary did he write? Webster's, Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> he was a famous American educationalist and a man who worked with words. I, when a man preaches to me, he said, I want him to make it a personal matter, a personal matter, a personal matter. And John Newton says that some sermons are like a letter which has been dropped in the street. And if everyone in London read it, all of them would think it was for somebody else. <laughs> because it doesn't appear to to be saying anything to anybody in particular. Uh, it's focusing, application is the focusing of the, of the passage upon the individual life. Uh, I had part of my childhood, quite a substantial part, of course, in the tropics. Oh, it's lovely to sit in the school behind the girl and the sun is shining through the window and you have a magnifying glass. <laughs> Well, it's a wonderful thing. And you just focus it on her neck and then you get that little singeing... Oh, boys love this. A little bit of smoke coming off a girl, just think of it. And she goes, ah! And it, Olive! And you say, never touched her, sir! Now we know. Yeah. But here's all these rays of God's truth. So focus them so that they come down and actually burn a life, touch a life, change a life. Now, when I wrote this little book on preaching, which is now over there, someone suggested to me that I should call it, give it a different title. This is the title they suggested. Preaching is about change, and that's all it's about. And that is right, actually. That's pretty much right. Some people think they've heard a great sermon if they go out with a thrill. Well, I think you should go out with a thrill. But a preaching is not really a successful sermon if, if the people don't go out there and, and apologise for their arguments and pay their debts and, and do all the other things which Scripture demands and enjoy the promises and revel in the doctrines and enjoy the, the comforts of the Word of God. It's got to change people. A lecture only aims to give information. 
a sermon actually aims to change men and women for how long? Forever! And it can't do that unless the sermon is like a court official who knocks at your door and says, Are you Jack Jones? Yes. Come to court and you've got a summons telling you to do something. And no sermon is a real sermon unless it does that. So that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about in this final, in this final session. That's the definition of application. Here's the importance of it. The sermon becomes a message. I sometimes look at the order of service which preachers have. You know, hymn, prayer, hymn, collection. Get rid of them. Reading, hymn, and then it says sermon. <laughs> Never call it a sermon. It's a dull old word, isn't it? Sermon. What should you call it? Message! Because you've got to stand there, as we just learned in the last session, as a man who believes from God, through his word, by his spirit, you have a message for the men and women in front of you. And if you haven't got that, your sermon will have no soul, it'll have no life, and probably have very little interest. You're out for the conscience, and I'm glad you stressed that, because that is always our aim. You're out for the conscience. You're aiming for the conscience. Now, that some people fire arrows. There was a fellow in the Bible who fired an arrow. He just fired it into the air. What happened? Yeah, it came down and killed King Ahab. Well, there are sermons like that. You know, you're aiming at no one in particular, but you just fire away. And sometimes people get converted or changed forever. Now, thank God for his providence. But there was a famous battle called the Battle of Agincourt. Have you heard of that? I don't like to tell you this, but the archers in the Battle of Agincourt were Welsh. And they fired into the air. Why? Yeah, because they were firing longbows and they were sufficiently skilled to know that they could uh, adjust the tra trajectory, but actually, although they were firing in the air, they had a very clear target. And they fired into the air so accurately that they destroyed the French. I'm not gloating over that, but it was pretty good archery, wasn't it? Yeah. So, you've got to be aiming at something. And now, let's think, of, let's think of a surgeon with a knife. He's a pretty dangerous fellow, isn't he? The sharpest knife in the kingdom. What's he going to do with it? He's going to heal, isn't he? But he's got to put, he's got to put in the knife to heal. Uh, I'm glad he aims, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, I had a lady in our church whose life was ruined forever because the surgeon was 85 or 6 or something and I don't think he aimed very accurately. The importance of application is that's what makes preaching preaching. Now, as a as a boy in school, I was obliged to read Plato. Plato. Aristotle. Herodotus. Oh, it's horrendous. But in all their writings, there's something lacking. Application. And then, of course, you read the New Testament. You read the, the sermon, the, the message that Paul gave at the Areopagus. It's got a point to it. It's there to change people. Did you notice how that Areopagus sermon ended that David wrote to us, uh, read to us <laughs> earlier on? There's going to be a judgment. The proof of the judgment is that God has appointed the judge. We know who the judge is because God's raised him from the dead. He wasn't going to let them get away, was he, with academic truth? He was out there to change them forever. And people don't like application, but that's how the work gets done. I was once preaching in the Jura Mountains. Anyone know where the Jura Mountains are? That's half the answer. That's the other half of the answer. <laughs> so you now I know where the Jura Mountains are. At a convention. Now, being a biblical preacher, I hope, I was making some application. But there was a pastor sitting near the back and he was getting very red and very agitated. I thought, well, he's, you know, he's, not, he's not one of those. So I haven't offended him. <laughs> Why is he getting upset? 
As soon as I'd finished, he came down and spoke to me. Monsieur Oliot, he says. That's what they called me in those days. He says, my, ch- my, my church members are not children. And they are not fools. You don't have to spell out the implications of what you say as clearly as that. Well, I admit that my preaching isn't perfect. That was a pretty big admission, by the way. He was wrong, wasn't he? Have you ever sat in church and someone says, oh, that was a great sermon. Pity Mrs. Jones wasn't here. Just the sermon she needed. God's providence had kept Mrs. Jones away. The sermon was precisely the sermon you needed properly. People are very unselfish, aren't they, when it comes to application? They think, they think oh, this is not for me. Yeah, you, can, you can have that one. Yeah. So, application makes preaching, preaching. So, this is how pointed application is to be made. And you'll see that there's a few um, sub-points now. Be specific. What does that mean? Well, what doesn't it mean? No, it's not a 12-4 blasting shot everywhere. So what is it? He's good, isn't he? He's got illustrations, this fellow. <laughs> it is. But, it, but we have to be careful. There's something that it doesn't mean for all that. It doesn't mean Hisham, does it? Why not? That's personal. <laughs> well, it, there are exceptions. <laughs> I think, generally speaking, let the Word of God do its work in such a way that they know that the Word of God has done its work, and it's not just the preacher putting on the pressure. And besides, most people aren't going to listen if they're embarrassed, are they? But don't be content just to describe things generally and in terms of principle, but put it in black and white terms. Listen to Charles Bridges. Is he quote on here? Yes, it is. Yeah. Preaching, here, in order to be effective, must be reduced from vague generalities to a tangible individual character coming home to every man's business and even to his bosom. That's a pretty old-fashioned quote, isn't it? But you've got to bring it home and spell it out. That's why I read Mark 7. Would you like to come back there? Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. Jesus was specific. Now, there's this debate about if you eat certain things, will it make you unclean? Mark chapter 7, verse 14. Hear me, everyone, and understand. That's interesting, isn't it? He doesn't just say, listen. Hear me, everyone, and understand. That's already getting a little bit specific. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, that's pretty general, isn't it? But Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't say, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's not homeopathic medicine that will ruin your spiritual life. Did he? He didn't say, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not what comes outside from a man that ruins your spiritual life. He did say that, but that's not all that he said. He said it's from what comes within you that spoils your spiritual life. Now that's where 99% of modern preachers would stop. But not Jesus. Verse 20. What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed. There it is now. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. A dozen or more specific sins he mentions because he's putting flesh upon the principle. You may not be guilty, you think, of theft, 
So he talked about evil thoughts, covetousness, pride, foolishness, because he's going to bring it home to your heart. Whoever you are in the crowd, you will know that this is true of you. There are countless, countless examples of that in the New Testament. What was wrong with the Samaritan woman? Right? So what did Jesus say to her? Did, she say, did he say to her, you're a wicked woman. You want the water of life, but you're a wicked woman. What did he say to her? He said, go call your husband. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? He didn't say, you've got an idol in your life, you've got to go and break it. What did he say? Sell what you have, give it to the poor, take up your cross, and follow me. It's not enough to say to people, if you've got an idol in your life, give it up. You know what they will say inside their hearts? Well, I haven't got an idol. Other people might have. Yeah. But you have. If your house burns down, by the way, and you could only rescue one thing, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, we had to say that. She's in the corner. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty easy way of finding it. It's a, this process of elimination is a fairly good way of finding out what's precious to you, isn't it? If you have to choose between this and this, what would you choose? Um, that's exactly, of course, how the Lord behaved towards the rich young ruler. He has to choose Christ for his possessions. And that way Christ shows to him that he has got an idol. And so it goes on. Spell it out. Spell it out. Put flesh on it. Storm the conscience. Storm the conscience with specifics with specific questions which have to be answered silently. Make folk reflect upon the truth which they're hearing in a personal way. Whitfield did it. Wesley did it. Ryle did it. Edwards did it. And there's a famous preacher in Welsh history called John Jones. Can you believe it? John Jones. I wonder how many people there are. He was once asked about his preaching. Oh, my preaching, he said. It's quite easy. What I do is I take into the pulpit a few bombs and I throw one out and it kills a few people. And after a few minutes I throw out another one and it kills a few more people. He says, and that's the way I continue with my sermon until they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did he mean? <laughs> he meant that he looked the people in the eyes and he just kept throwing out applications until he'd struck the conscience of every single person. One way or another, he was going to get them. And if there was one holding out, he would find something until he shot him as well. Or blown him away with a bomb. Yeah. Be specific. Apply, apply, apply. Be discriminating. That's a big word. Who's in church? Because I'm talking about pulpit now, aren't I? Well, there's a visitor who's in the service today who's never been in church before. Probably a total pagan, but for some reason or other is in church. But there's also a regular attender who's been coming for 57 years and is not yet converted. Are you going to say exactly the same things to both of them? There's a bored teenager who's made up his mind that whatever else happens in this life, he's never going to be converted. But there's another teenager who's anxious and concerned about his soul. Are you going to treat them both the same? There's a new Christian, nonetheless, who's been living with a woman for the last several years and has six or seven children by her. And there's another new Christian who's been brought up in a Christian family and hasn't got that sort of baggage. You, are you going to treat them all the same? Are you going to say exactly the same sort of things to these people? But they're there in front of you. There's Fred who's been converted three days. Yeah. 
And there's Jack who's been converted three decades. Are their needs the same? There's that person over there who's got strong temptation. But there's that one over there who's got subtle temptation. Not the same thing, you know. There's one who's afflicted with doubts. But there's one who's walking dangerously along the road towards unbelief. It's not the same thing either. And you're going to take the Bible passage and expound it and explain what it means and what it means to them. Him, her, him, her, them. You can't do that without application. It can't be done. There's the young lad who's just gone up into comprehensive school. There's the student who's just finishing at university. There's the, the, the young man who's yearning inside to go into the pastoral ministry. There's the married couple thinking seriously about a family. There's the unmarried single. There's the widow. There's the sad. There's the lonely. There's the elderly. There's the ill. There's the disturbed. And there's countless other sorts of people as well. And one of the greatest books in the English language is Alarm to the Unconverted. Ever heard of it? by Joseph Alleyne. What Joseph Alleyne does in one of his chapters is he shows that not all unconverted people are the same. He shows that there are ten different sorts of people who are openly unconverted. And he does it by looking at Bible texts. Then he shows that there are twelve secret marks of being unconverted. And he shows by looking at various scripture texts that there are 22 different sorts of unconverted people. You really need to read the book. And he does that without butchering a text anywhere. And then he says, if God has so described men and women differently, you've got to apply the word accordingly. You can't treat them all the same. So you've got to prepare the cloth and then cut it to suit this one and this one and this one and this one. That's what makes preaching preaching. Finally, you've got to be persuasive. Now, you can't be persuasive just by whipping people. I think actually it might be a good idea to come to a Bible passage. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. I wasn't intending to do this, but this is probably a good thing to do. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, the Lord talks about charitable deeds. Then verses 5 to 15, he talks about prayer. And then verses 16 to 18, he talks about fasting. If you look carefully at those passages, you'll see our Lord does three things. First of all, he tells you what to do. Charitable deeds, prayer, fasting. Then he tells you how to do it. How do you, how do, you do your charitable deeds? Secretly. How do you do your prayer? Secretly. How do you do your fasting? Without drawing attention to yourself. He tells us what to do and how to do it. It's not enough to stop there. That's already very good, but it's not enough. What to do, how to do it, and why it's worth doing. That's the point. Why is it worth doing charitable deeds? Verse 4. What's the answer? There's a reward. Who gives it to you? Yeah, your father who sees. Why is it worth praying? Verse 6. It's a reward. Who gives it to you? The Father who sees. <coughs> Why is it worth, fast, worth fasting? Verse 18. It's a reward given by your Father who sees. So he explains what to do, how to do it, and why it's worth doing. And if you read the great preachers of history, they all do that. It's persuasion. Get out of debt! That's what to do. 
And you can say that with authority from the word of God. How to do it? I don't think you can say with the same authority, but at least you can give some honest suggestions. To get out of debt, for some of you it means getting rid of your computer, for others of you it means getting rid of your car, for other of you it means giving up a favourite hobby, and for other of you it means this, this, this and this and this. But at least you're giving some ideas how to do it, and why, why is it worth doing? Well, I think you could go back to the Bible there quite clearly from the book of Proverbs, which shows that if you're in debt to people, you're always their slave. Besides, debt isn't something that God blesses. You can persuade people. I have a friend who was in his early ministry, he was about two years or three years into his ministry, he just found that people didn't pray in the prayer meeting. But he had never understood this principle. He kept saying, pray, 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 pray. And do you know what happened? Nothing. One Monday night he just said, pray your dogs. And do you know what happened? Nothing. He did it all wrong, didn't he? He should have showed to them that they should pray and how it should be done and why it's worth doing. He would have had a completely different response. Completely different. Over the years, I've taken lots of young people walking in the mountains. And they always say the same thing. Oh, why have we got to carry a bivy bag? If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. Why have we got to carry a litre of water with some sugar and salt mixed in it? Why have we got to carry a spare pullover? Why have we got to carry some waterproof leggings? Why have we got to carry a hat? Why have we got to carry sandwiches? Why can't we just carry a can of coat and get up the hill? It's not enough for me to say, do as I say or don't come at all, is it? Because you know what will happen? Nobody will come at all. <laughs> <laughs> then you explain about what has happened often, even in summertime on mountains. Just gently explain. And do you know what happens before you've even finished? They've got their hand rucksacks on their back and they're ready to go. Because you've explained what to do and how to do it and why it's worth doing. Because the vast majority of people on mountains don't go there because they want to die. And countless people do every year because nobody ever told them why it's worth doing. That's what persuasion involves. Just think of a football team. You've got these kids, you know, nine and ten year olds. All they want to do is, is win. But they don't want to train. They don't mind going on a Saturday and playing the game, but you've got training sessions. But if, if you can explain to them that if they can be fitter than anybody else and run faster than anybody else and dribble a ball while they're doing that run, fast running, if you can explain to them that by developing certain skills and certain fitness and certain speed, they will virtually always win, then they'll come to the training. But we seem to leave this out of our pulpit. I'm glad I wasn't in the First World War. You lived in a muddy trench. There were ladders going up towards the sandbags. And you knew that one day you would have to put all your kit on, stand at that ladder, and then a whistle would blow and you'd have to run up it and towards the enemy. A third of you would be killed at once, maybe more. More than a third of you would bleed to death in no man's land. Some of you might get to the enemy and back safely. Why do men run up a ladder to almost certain death? It's no good the general coming down and saying, I'm the general and you're the troops. You've just got to do it. Because it won't happen. Persuade their duty. How do you persuade them that it's their duty? Yeah, how else? Exactly, so you say something like this. Listen, that's... Some of you are going to die. Some of you are going to bleed to death. Some of you are going to come back wounded. This battle won't win the war. But it, it'll contribute towards winning the war. And if we don't win the war, how many of you men are married? Your wives will be raped. How many of you have got kids? They'll be horribly oppressed and maybe cruelly treated. 
And you could go on like that a little while, couldn't you? And do you know what? It, you will now blow the whistle and they'll go over the top. And they did, you know, didn't they? Because sergeants took the time and trouble to explain these things. That's what you've got to do. This is how you do it. But this is why it's worth doing, even though in for many of you, most of you, it's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. That is persuasion. And persuasion is an outstanding and important part of our preaching. So I'm pleading with you, if you preach at all, if you've never preached before, listen to this in sermons, because otherwise you haven't heard a sermon. If you preach from time to time, open air, pavement, pulpit, or if you preach regularly, this is what makes preaching, preaching. Your great aim under God is to glorify him. To glorify him by transforming non-saints into saints. And to glorify him by transforming saints into saintly saints. And you can only do that with application. I think that's enough and I'll take some questions on all the things that have been said today. That wasn't a very good conclusion, was it? There's one here and there's one there. Sure, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Think about application. There are some people who would say uh, that as a preacher, their responsibility is to preach the truth and trust and, and, and leave the Holy Spirit to apply it specifically to people. Uh, and there are some good people who would say that. You say to that. Uh, uh, let me. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the question is uh, there are people who say that it's the duty of the preacher to give the truth but to leave the applying of that to the Holy Spirit. I think it's stuff and nonsense. Uh, that quote <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you can quote me. I think it's stuff and nonsense because that's not the way it's done in the Bible. But, but, but on that, if they say, well, Jesus could apply it because he knew people's hearts and we don't necessarily... I would say to that that over two-thirds of the Bible is, the, is Old Testament. Half the Old Testament is prophetic preaching. And in the prophetic preaching, it's all spelled out very, very clearly. It, they don't just give the truth and leave it hanging in the air. They actually apply it very specifically indeed, sometimes even to specific individuals. That, they they yeah. might say that, but we're not prophets. No, we're not prophets, but we have a prophetic word, we have a Christ-centered word, and we have an apostolic word. I just don't think that's the way it's done. And I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I actually think actually it does discredit to the Holy Spirit, personally. Because he's instituted preaching, and preaching is not just the giving of information. Um, it's, uh, it's one of my great fears about evangelicalism, it might just be a bit technical at the moment, is that it's becoming Lutheranized. Now, I'm not talking about Martin Luther. But... There is a Lutheranized theology. Lutheran theology says that spirit works by the word. Reformed theology says the spirit works in, with, through, and under the word. What's the difference? Lutheranized theology just believes that if you just make the meaning plain, you've got nothing else to do at all. At all. I just don't see that in the New Testament. I don't see any sermon where it's done like that. And I don't see that that's the way scripture goes at all. Scripture goes constantly by God as a person, dealing with a person, through a person, who speaks to them as a person. And they've got, therefore, and therefore the preacher requires a verdict, and they've got to make a response to it. Sorry, I'm getting worked up now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree with you. I know you do. <laughs> yeah. Should, should a message ever, if you notice someone who's in the congregation, should you ever tailor part of what you're saying 
to that particular person. That's what you're saying. You, they, they, you know someone has a need, should you tailor what you say to that person in that very message? Well, the first part of my answer would be that Mrs. Jones must be able to see that whatever application you make does actually come out of the scripture that you're preaching. It hasn't just been invented for the occasion. That there is a clear line from the text into her heart. But I see no difficulty at all about speaking to Mrs. Jones from the passage as long as I'm not embarrassing or actually identifying Mrs. Jones. It might be, I, don't, I shouldn't be saying, for example, um, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lady in the church tonight who's got a Welsh name, who's, who's widowed and has, but has got three children, uh, eight, ten and seven. I don't, you can't do that. But there, it's true that we do know all sorts of things about the people in front of us, especially if we, we visit our people. And we realise that sometimes this truth is, will apply in a certain way and we shouldn't be ashamed of taking, making that application, but we must not embarrass or identify the person to whom we're speaking. But can I add a rider to that? Sometimes in the act of preaching, we start saying things and we don't know why we've said them. Because there is such a thing as surrender to the Holy Spirit. And one day, I've never preached on Freemasonry in my life, but one day I started making applications about Freemasons. I thought, that isn't in my notes, and I'm not really sure why I'm saying this. (laughs) Afterwards, one of the elders came to me and said, how did you know? I said, know what? That my father was in the service. I said, I didn't know your father was in the service, never met your father. Oh, he said, because he's the leading Freemason in Liverpool. So that happens too. There was a very specific application for a man, but I think sometimes it's a spirit-given application. We've no idea that those people are there. We had a a, a lady in our own church. She left us. And uh, I've told a lot about people leaving our church. (laughs) I remember another preacher saying he was building two churches, and I think we are at the moment. (laughs) But one of them quite accidentally... Um, a lady left us and uh, later when we, we found out why she said because you're all talking to David about me and he keeps mentioning all that you're saying about me in his messages and of course nobody had ever discussed her with me no. uh, of course but somehow inadvertently to me, that is incident, accidentally by me the, the applications were making her feel that I must know all her secrets. Um, And that preaching can often do this, can't it? I want to make the point, however, that applications are not all challenges. And they're not all rebukes. There's comfort in the gospel, there's joy in the gospel, there's all sorts of blessings in the gospel. Um, I once went into a church with a, a very big theological question in my mind, which I didn't think anybody could answer, but it was troubling me deeply because it would affect the way I, I ministered. And the, the man got up to preach, and he, he addressed precisely that question. And the comfort which flooded into my soul and rescued me, really, that he had no idea about. So there's something glorious in preaching. There's one there, one there. Let's yeah. go with you, and then we'll go over there. Um, just asking a question regarding preparation. Just yesterday I was speaking and I really put some into the text. But I know it's not black and white, but I, I prepared what I was going to read from. And I knew what the point was going to make, but I made no preparation whatsoever other than that. It went fantastic. It was such a passion for that. Previous before that, I put time and time in, rewriting, rewriting what I was going to say. And when I got up there, I was so concerned that I didn't miss out. <coughs> Okay, so no, it's all right. So there's uh, there can be great passion, and sometimes we preach with passion, and that really seems to be what was needed. Other times, enormous preparation, and then we're hamstrung by our preparation almost. 
where's the balance and uh, stress to be placed? Well, I believe the balance is like this, that you prepare as thoroughly, as thoroughly, as thoroughly as it's possible for a human to do. So you do all your exegetical work and your doctrinal work and your structure and your applications and your illustrations so that you've prepared as much as you can because you're going to answer at the judgment seat not only for the act of preaching but for the preparation for preaching. That done, I believe you go into the pulpit with abandonment. Abandonment without preparation will make you a ranting fanatic. But all that preparation without abandonment will make you a, a mere, monotonous, boring, stilted, dull puppet. I think I made the point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be my answer. Yeah, it's yeah. like one of the great yeah. contradictions like you were saying before, yeah. in that you need to be fully prepared, but then let it all go. Yeah. So, yeah. I've, I've heard people who just rant and rave and shout, and, and it's no good at all. But I've heard others who say, oh, there is a group of Baptists in Britain called the Gospel Standard Strict Baptists. Have you ever heard of them? Who actually believe that the personality of the preacher must never ever be seen. So that if anything does happen, it must be God who did it. And they literally stand in front of the people and they don't look at anybody and talk as monotonously as possible about the great truths of the Gospel. And if anybody gets transformed at all, it must be a work of God because there's no way otherwise it could have happened. <laughs> And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but not very. I'm not actually exaggerating very much. Actually, that was too fast. For that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, it was over there. Um, then, yeah. This wasn't. This is about preaching, but it's not really about what he's talking about today, is it? Yeah. Why not? Okay. Have you ever felt? Um, Okay, so do you ever come to a topic and because of things going on in your life you feel that you just uh, have a problem with the topic itself because you're out of sync with it? And uh, how do you deal with problems like that? The difference between what you're going to say and what you are. God does not bless hypocrites. He sends hypocrites to hell. So if I knowingly preach one truth but nurse a sin of which I'm speaking against in my own life, I'm in, in enormous spiritual danger. So there I'm making a deliberate choice to say one thing but to be another. That is hypocrisy. That is not the same, however, as recognising that there is this scriptural demand, I've not lived up to it as I should, but I want to, and I've come back to the cross again and again and again, and confess this and learn something of the, the sweet cleansing power of the blood of Christ again in my conscience. So I think that's one thing that we've got to remember. I was asked once as a young man, are you going to silence the truth of God simply because of your own personal failures? I think that's a legitimate question. No, I'm not going to silence the truth of God simply because of my personal failures. The truth of God must be proclaimed anyway. And people say, we must never preach beyond your experience. I think that's stuff and nonsense as well. However would I preach on heaven? Absolutely not. Yeah, because our Lord didn't. Yeah, I went to a school where boxing was compulsory. I've often used this illustration. When I took O-level, I was 16, obviously. I was 5 stone 12. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't Mr. Muscle. Well, I was actually. I was like the Mr. Muscle in the advert. <laughs> and I was, I was in a school where boxing was compulsory. I was, Why am I telling you this? Well, I'll tell you. You get to that stage in life where you're down here and everybody else in your class is up here. And boxing is compulsory. So I learned one little trick. 
one little trick. You talk to the opponent, and you talk to him and talk to him, and you hit him in the middle of the sentence. (laughs) And they never expect it. They always think you'll wait till the end of the sentence. And and that's why I'm I'm reasonably beautiful. (laughs) No, I think the same is true with application. Catch them. Give them an application when they're not expecting it because there's a power in that sort of application. If you wait all till the end, it's like when you give a children's address. Some of you do this. You tell the story, and all the kids are like this, and then you come to the application, and what happens? They all begin to sh- shuffle and switch off and nudge each well, especially the boys, nudge each other and look down at their shoes. That's not the way to do it, is it? You tell a bit of the story, and then give them a bit of application, and tell a bit more of the story, and then give them a bit more of the application when they're not expecting it. That's how our Lord does it. And one third of the Sermon on the Mount is application. But it's not all at the end. It's all the way through. This, um, coming from uh, an Arabic culture, uh, seeing a lack of uh, politeness to certain sorts of people, whether it be on speaking to Moroccan, this kind of thing, seeing as so. So, how can younger people make pointed application to mature people whom they respect or who should be respected without appearing to be um, above them, without appearing to be um, insolent even? Well, I think there are a number of things. First of all, I don't think you should point the finger in almost any culture. Because even in our culture, that's regarded as a bit... I I think you should point the finger point the hand if you do anything, personally. So that's one thing. Secondly, not all application is denouncing people or knocking them down or sh- showing them up or exposing them. A good deal, and I mean a very good deal of biblical application is, is comfort and reassurance and strengthening, isn't it? Um, older people generally don't mind that, do they? They don't mind the reassurances and the comforts and the encouragements of Scripture it's, it's where it's getting a little bit um, uh-huh. That I think you've just got to be a servant of Christ. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I think you've got to show to them that there's a direct line from the passage into their lives. And all you're doing is being the servant of the word you are, you are bringing that word, that word, to bear upon their life, whoever they may be. And I think at that point, you've just got to get on with it. It's, it's, it's true in every culture to some extent. If you, what you do in a village chapel, where there are 12 people present, six of them are your family, I don't mean your children, I mean relatives, and all the others are your close neighbours who you know really well, it's very hard to make a bold application, isn't it? But you do it with grace, and you do it with love, and you do it with concern, and you do it with gentleness, and I don't think you ever do it with bad manners, but you've still got to do it. And what you do as a minister, where you come to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, which says that the elders that rule well receive a double salary, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. And you're the elder who labors in the word and doctrine. And you've got to look people in the eyes and say, basically you're saying people like me should be paid a double salary. What do you do now? Well, what do you do now? Well, I wouldn't. I'll preach it. (laughs) Because they might say that's special pleading. But the point is, it isn't, is it? Because it's in the passage. That's just a thought. That just came to 
Doesn't the apostle tell us in to tell pastors uh, when he's addressing them to speak to older men as fathers and uh, mothers are, are mm-hmm. to the women, younger women as sisters in all purity, and therefore the manner in which we address many applications is given to us in Scripture. So we shouldn't be afraid, but we need to be. You know, the tram lines which keep us on on track with application is there. They're fathers. Therefore, we find a way. How would we speak to our father if there was an issue we needed to raise with him? Once we think of these men as fathers, surely we we can then raise it as if they were our own father on a matter.